Here, here God comes to visit Abraham, and the parson is telling us this. Because this teaches us an important thing. This shows us, firstly, the significance of visiting the sick, that God himself goes to visit Abraham when Abraham's sick because he just had surgery, right, because he, he circumcised himself, right, when he was an, an older person. So it says that God appears to Abraham while he's in the, this area owned by Mamre, Vuhu Yoshek Pesach Ohel Mayom, and Abraham is sitting at the entrance to his tent, in the heat of the day. Now, the, the, the commentaries ask numerous questions about this. First thing, if he's so sick that God should come and visit him, what's he doing sitting at the door? Like, why isn't he in bed? And, and why is he sitting at the door in the middle of the day? Like, I can tell you that, uh, that when I was a kid, if I got sick, my mother would have killed me. If I'm, if I'm sick enough to stay home from school, but I'm going to go, go sit outside, right? I, that's the last thing I can do. And here Abraham really is ill, right? And, and nevertheless... We've got, um, you know, we've got Abraham being ill, and, never, and nevertheless, um, God is coming to see him, and he's still sitting by the tent, by the edge of the tent. And why is that? So the Torah tells us that he is he is in emotional pain. The emotional pain is that he is unable to welcome guests into his home. The Medrash explains us the following things going on. Abraham is sitting at the en- entrance to his tent because he wants to see if anybody's walking by. He wants to invite people into his home. He wants to, uh, he, he lives on the edge of a desert. People are going there. They have nowhere to eat, nowhere to drink, nowhere to sleep, and he wants to help them. He's not well, right? But nevertheless, he feels that his ability to help people is more important than his not being well. And therefore, he wants to do that. God, on the other hand, understands that as much as Abraham wants to do this, it's not best for him. And therefore, God makes it amazingly hot that day. That's why it says, in the heat of the day. He makes it a very hot day so that nobody would be walking by. People wouldn't come then because of that. And therefore, because people are, are not, you know, not going to be walking by, Abraham should be able to feel better and take it easy and not have to go and sit outside his tent to welcome people. The problem is, is that Abraham doesn't accept this, and he feels it's necessary for him still to go and wait for people, for visitors to come. And so that's the picture that we're seeing. God is there. Abraham is looking for visitors. God is making it, he doesn't want visitors to come because he wants Abraham to recuperate. And that's why it's such a hot day. And then it says, the next sentence, Vayisa and of, and Abraham then raises his eyes. He looks out into the distance and it says, Ve'yira, and he sees, Ve'hine shlosha nashim nitzavim alav. And it says, and there are three men sta- standing there. Ve'yira, and he sees them. Ve'yaretz, and he runs after them. Le'kras them to greet them. Ve'pesach ha'oel, leaving the de- entranceway of his tent. Ve'yishtachavu artsa, and he bows down in front of them. So what happens now is, is three people show up, even though it's so hot out, even though Abraham's been sick, all of that's going on. Nevertheless, Abraham looks out and he says this. Now, uh, a problem arises immediately, which is God is visiting Abraham. Now, you don't think that if Abraham has God visiting him, that he should perhaps stick around? God is there, right? God is right there with him. And Abraham is still looking for visitors, and he sees visitors, he immediately cuts God off and runs out after the visitors. So from this, the Talmud teaches us an important statement, which is it is greater to greet people, right, to welcome people into your home, and to greet, greet strangers, than it is to visit with God. That even when you're in a situation where God is going to come and see you, he's going to have you a prophetic experience with you, but nevertheless, it's more important for you to visit, to, to greet visitors. Right? Why, what's the idea behind it? Because we have a mitzvah, right? We understand there's a mitzvah and there's also a natural feeling in many people that if somebody's in trouble, somebody's in need, somebody's alone, somebody is hungry, that we should try to help them. But you say, but I'm talking to God. God is so important. Mm-hmm. God, it's a, who gets to talk to God, mm-hmm. right? I, let, shall we make it a smaller version of this, right? You, you, you've got Bill Gates right, standing at the door of your house, and three poor people walk down the street. Are you going to just say to Bill Gates, you know what, I don't got time for you, and go run after the three poor people? Now, you might do it, but we would think that that's not the preferred way of doing things. 
uh, Bill Gates is coming to see you. Perhaps he's going to fund something. He's going to help you with something. Something will happen. But rather, you run away from him and you go help three poor people who don't benefit you, right? Somebody else could take care of them. Why do you have to do it at that moment so you can get the next three poor people to walk by? But here it tells you it is greater to, to help people, to invite them into your home, to feed them, to give them something to drink, to make them feel better, to be a friend than it is to even be spending time talking to God. That's a very important point. We've now learned two important things here. First, that God comes to visit Abraham while Abraham's in surgery, right? He's post-surgical, and he's recuperating, and it's so important to visit a sick person that even God does this. And then secondly, that even if God is visiting you, even if you're having a conversation with God, right, the most important entity in the world, it is still more significant to go out and take care of the uh, take care of the poor right it's a very big difference and th these are two important points but now let's look at some of the specifics in the words which teaches some more things it says that he looks up and he sees three men and it, it uses an interesting word here it says nitzavim alav they are literally it means they're standing over him right i mean in colloquialism and the way we use the words it's it, it means that they're close to him like they're right there Right? But literally, it means they're standing above him. We're going to come back to that, because it's going to use that uh, another expression later on that's similar, and we're going to contrast them. But what does it mean that they're standing above him? Then it says, right, so then he runs to go greet them, and he bows down to them. And, it's, and it says, Viomer Adoni, and he says to them, my masters, Im no benecha. If I... If it is a good idea for you, if you are happy to see me, <coughs> I'll not tavor me al Don't turn away from me. Right? Come to my house. Gikach na ma'at ma'im. Let me give you a little bit of water. The ruks or aglechem, so you should wash your legs. The shanu me al tachas ha'etz, and you should rest under the tree. So he says to them, please come with me. But the first thing he says to them is, I want you to wash your feet. I'm giving you water. Take a little bit of water to wash your feet. What, what is it? What's the significance of washing your feet? I just told you, he's going to invite them in to eat, to drink, to sleep, and washing your feet. So here we, we have another important point. Abraham is prepared to go out of his way right, to help them. He doesn't care who they are. They don't have to be like him. They don't have to know him. They don't have to come from the same place as him. No, there are people in need. He's there to help them. But he has one prerequisite. The, the commentaries say, based on the Talmud, that Abraham's asking them to wash their feet before they come is that it says that the that the pagans of that era used to worship the earth. Right? We have it also, and even you have to, even today you have some Aboriginals who worship the earth. That the earth is, a, and even the Greeks talked about the earth being eternal. So they had people who worshipped the earth, and the way that they did it was was that they, it was with dirt, because dirt is the earth, right? They don't mean earth, they mean the globe, or the earth, but it's made up of dirt. So they would. So the way they would say it is they worship the dirt of their, uh, that, that was on, the, on them. And in other words, the dirt was part of their prayer service, that they would get dirty. So Abraham is saying, I want to have you in my house. I want to help you. But there's a, and the only rule I have is, you can't be practicing idol worship in my house. You do at this point. He's not telling them what they can do and they can't do in their lives. He's saying, "In my home, that's all I'm asking of you. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you, but just, just I can't have you come in and worship idols. You can't come in with paganism into my home." And this is an important point that separates us from other religions in, in another way, which is, is that we feel that paganism, right, the the belief of any other power than God in the world, the belief that an object can have power, right, we can. Uh, we can advance it to today and say the belief that money right, is more powerful than God, that we'll do anything for money, even not keep what God asks of us, right? that, that anything is more powerful than God right, is a form of idol worship. And we say that that must be destroyed. You, cannot, you can't fix it. There's no, I don't mean the people can't be fixed. The belief can't be fixed. And you don't find that with some other religions. As some other religions took paganism and turned it into their religion. If you ever go to Italy, you'll notice that that many of the statues of early saints were the same statues 
as, as Roman gods. There were Roman gods that when Catholicism right, found ethical monotheism right, and they started practicing the Roman Catholic belief, Right, and they and they and the emperors of Rome became followers of this, later to become like the Pope. So they um, they took all of the idols of of the, the pagans and they made them into they, they they named them for saints, so that they weren't praying to idols anymore. Right? We they said we can raise the level of paganism and turn it into something holy, and we say paganism is too destructive. You can't. You have to make an act of showing that it cannot be a part, it can't be made holy. It's a different philosophy. And our belief, therefore, was the first thing Abraham does is tell them, you wash your feet. Please, let me give you some water to wash your feet. So that is to rid yourself of this negativity before you come into my home. So then he does that. Then he says, Take the water, wash your feet. And he gave to them bread. The sadu libchem achad tovru kealav dechem. Why don't I just read it for you in English? He he says, "I'll get you some bread that you can eat. Then you can come and you and, and you can go on your way. Just do so, just as you have said." They, they answer him, right? And he, he, what does he say to them? He says, "Wash your legs and then come to my house for a moment. I'll give you some bread and then you can go. Right? You'll be you won't be hungry anymore. You'll be feel, you'll be rested. That's all I'm asking of you." And they say, "Okay." Now, we know that's not what he does. And this is a very interesting indication. It tells us in Pirkei Avos that you should say a little but do a lot. Most people say a lot and do a little. Here Abraham does just this. He says a little. He says, come in and have a little bit of bread. We will soon see that he slaughters an animal and he gives them meat. He gives them butter. He gives them bread. He gives them all types of items, including like, um, uh, like mustard and ketchup. Right? He gives them, and it says it explicitly, and he gives them all types of things. But he only says to them, come by my house, let me give you a little bit of bread. Right? And in reality, he does much more for them. And this is also an indication that when we are dealing with people, right, don't, we shouldn't make promises we can't keep. We shouldn't promise more than we choose to keep. Abraham could have said, I'll make a lavish meal for you. And he would have. And he did it many times. But he only says, he only says this. They agree. Right? So that's where we are, that they've agreed. So he says, so Abraham hastens to the tent to Sarah, and he says, Hurry, three says of meal, fine flour, make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the cattle. He took a calf, tender and good, and he gave it to the youth who hurried to prepare it. He took cream and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed them before them. He stood over them beneath the tree, and they ate. So now Abraham goes, and he takes, the, uh, he takes an animal. Right? He, he asks Sarah to make bread. He finds a youth, the youth. The youth is Yishmoel his son, right, who's later the founder of the Arab world. So he takes Yishmael, he asks Yishmael to kill the animal, prepare the animal so that, that the, our guests can have food to eat. So and the, the rabbi says, Kashrut is such with, um, that a Jewish person can only kill an animal. And then here, he says he took cream and milk and the calf, so they were meeting, mixing meat and milk and meat. Right? They hadn't come into... Well, let, well I'll explain it, how he does it. So uh, let's go through in a, a, a bit of an order. So Yishmael kills the animal, right? And he prepares it for them. And now it says that Abraham, right, he, he takes cream and milk and the calf, which they had prepared. So first is, if you'll notice in the sentence, based on your question, first it's milk and then meat, which even we can do. You can have milk and then meat. You can't have meat and then milk, but you can have milk and then meat. That's first. Um, sec- secondly is, they, could, they didn't necessarily have to have it at the same meal. If you had the milk first and a separate meal, then it's certainly permissible. Right? Um, there are many other answers. Some of them are a bit esoteric, but that's the simplest answer for it. Um, so, but then if you notice at the end of the sentence, after he, he makes all this food, first thing is Abraham doesn't make it all. He does some, but he has his son and his wife prepare. And that's because... He wants his, his wife. His wife and him doing things together was natural. They were a team. Why does he ask his son to help? Because he wants to educate his son. He wants his son to understand the importance of inviting guests into your home. And you know it worked, because not only Ishmael, but today, the offspring of Ishmael, known as the Arab world, they're known for their hospitality. They're known for inviting people into their home. Right? Whatever negativity. You, you might think, think of some of them, or you might think of the problems that, that might exist. 
you have to hand it to them. When it comes to hospitality, they are very serious about it. And, and, we, and the Torah tells us here, written a long time before there was even Islam in the world, that Abraham taught this to his son, and his son is acknowledged both by us and by the Arab world, Yishmoel, to be the father of the Arab world. And here he's being educated to participate in this mitzvah. It's just no different than a father taking his child to shul. A father telling his child, there's a poor man at the door, give him a dollar. And the father takes a dollar from his pocket and gives it to the boy to give. So your children should learn. They should know how to act. Right? That's what he's doing. But then it says at the end, he placed this before them. He stood over them beneath the tree. Remember I said before we were going to talk about why it said that, that he meets these three people and they are standing over him. And now it says that Abraham is standing over them. You notice the difference? Mm-hmm. Right? It says, Vahu omed alehem, he is standing over them, tachas eis, under the tree, v'yochelu, and they ate. So, the commentaries tell us that what's the difference between the first one and the second one? In the first case, he meets these three people, and they're standing above him. In the next case, he's, he's, he's provided them a place to rest, to eat, to, to drink, and now he's standing over them. So, on one level, it's literal. They're standing over them, meaning that they're, that he's coming out to meet them and they're standing there. And in this case, they're seated, eating, and he's serving them. He's like a waiter in his own home. He's serving them. But on a spiritual level, a little bit of a deeper level, what it's telling us is that is we, we, we come to a conclusion about these three men, which becomes very evident soon, is that they're not men at all, that they're angels. These are three angels that come to see Abraham. Because God made it so hot, no man is going to come. Right? People aren't going to come. So who are these three people that come against God's will? Nobody can. If God doesn't want anyone to come, nobody comes. Like God controls it. So who are they? So it says that, that God sent these three angels, angels being the extension of God's will, are coming into the world to do specific jobs. When they meet Abraham, they're on a higher spiritual level than him. Because they're angels. He's a human. But when Abraham does the will of God and he takes them in and he doesn't care if they're like him, not like him, if they're rich, if they're poor, he just takes them in and they're human beings who need food, who need drink, who need a rest, and he takes care of them, his spiritual level becomes higher than angels. So he is standing over them. First they're standing over him, and then after he does this this act, he's standing over them. And they're eating. Right? So it's showing us the significance of how important it is to do these things, that a human being who does this becomes even higher than angels. Right? That's the, the, the next part. It also tells us, if you look in the words when I said to you that, um, that they should make, um, you should make bread, the commentaries tell us that he was telling Sarah to make matzah. He was actually make matzah, like we have on Passover. And this is foreshadowing for the future when the Jews will have matzah. Because we know that one of the things that happens here, and you'll see it literally, that the, uh, one of the angels, one of the men, who we know are angels, tells Abraham and Sarah that you're going to have a child, and his name is going to be Yitzhak. Right? We know that. That happens in a few pages. And, um, and the fact that they, that, you know, that, that they find this out, that, he's going to, that we know that Yitzhak was born on Passover. And this, and this is telling us that Abraham tells her to go get, make matzah. Now, there was no mitzvah to eat matzah because they didn't have the Torah. Even, at, even then, right, when you have the story of Passover, they ate matzah. It wasn't because it was a mitzvah. It was because they were in a hurry. They were leaving Egypt, so they ate matzah. From that point on, it became a mitzvah because God commanded us. But before then, he didn't command us. Here's an example where the forefathers understood the Torah philosophically in their mind. They understood it, and they followed it. So here they, he tells Sarah, make the matzah and because uh, it's Passover and they and they have it so then it goes on the next thing is that these angels ask Abraham a question they say Viomarilla they say to him a sorry at the top of the next page where is Sarah your wife where, where is she well first thing is he just spoke to her they were there and he spoke to her don't like did they forget like didn't they, they, Abraham says to his wife go make matzah Right? And they say, where's your wife? Right? The next thing is, it's a pretty odd thing for <clears throat> people in that time of history to be asking a man where his wife is. Uh, why do you want to know where my wife is? And what's, the, what's the purpose? It's a very odd thing. So they ask him, and then it says, Abraham tells them, she's in the tent. 
Right? We're on the edge of the tent. She's in the tent. And, and he says, I'll surely return. And so basically he gets her. Right? He, he makes it that she should know that she's part of this conversation. And then he says, this man, angel man, says, I will return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Right? She'll have a son. So that, this is the, pla- the, the foreshadowing. This is the prophecy that God is giving Abraham through the angel that your wife will have a son. Right? Because up until this point, God promises Abraham that he'll be a father of a great nation and Sarah will be the mother of a great nation. But they're old people and they have no children. How are they supposed to have a son? So here is the, where, it, where it happens. Now, here, this is, becomes very interesting because it says, Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old, well on in years. The manner of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Right? She was postmenstrual. She can't have children. And Sarah laughed at herself, saying, After I have withered, shall I again have delicate skin, and my husband is old. The angel, in the name of God, says to her, You're going to have a child. She finds this so absurd, so absurd, that she laughs. She says, but I'm an old lady. And not only that, my husband's an old man. Right? There's a very interesting section here right? where she says this. So then God now says to Abraham, now we no longer have the angels talking. Now God's talking. And it intersperses because when an angel talks, he's just saying the, what God wants. That's all he's doing. An angel is not a entity of its own. I spoke about it in the show last week. It was the, the purpose of our com- my class. An angel is simply the will of God. So if God, if God right, so, so that's why you're going to see the, it's switching back and forth between God and angel, God and angel. It's the same thing. So here it says that God says to Abraham, why is the Sarah laughed, saying, shall I in truth bear a child, though I have aged? Is anything beyond God? So here we have, um, God is, is a, little, a little bit perturbed with Sarah. God says, you, sends the angel, this time next year you're going to have a baby. Sarah says, well, that's crazy. I, I, I can't have a kid. I'm, I, I'm after that age. And my husband's an old man. He's going, to, he's going to impregnate me? Come on. So God says, why is Sarah laughing? Doesn't she know that if I say you can have a child, you can have a child? I'm God. Does she not understand me? And, and, and God says, and, and, and here's why I'm wondering. She says, how can I have a child? I'm, I've aged. But that's not really what she said. She says, I'm older, but my husband is old. God doesn't tell him that. You know that she leaves that out? God doesn't say that part. Mm-hmm. And this is, a, this is a sin of omission, as they say. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a lie. Mm-hmm. Because, okay. And so why is that? So here's a, a very important lesson. The Talmud says that no man wants to hear that his wife thinks he's an old man. Mm-hmm. No matter how old he is, he doesn't want to hear it from his wife because her opinion is important to him. And, and what, what would happen if God actually told him what Sarah said? It very well could be that Abraham would miss the message, which is Sarah needs to understand what I, as God, am able to do. And he would instead hear, my wife thinks I'm an old man. And he wouldn't get, be able to get past it. So here you find an occasion where God stretches the truth or might even say lies for the sake of peace between a husband and a wife. Right? If we know that God is true, right? God is real, he's true, here you actually see him be a little bit off from truth. He doesn't actually lie, he just doesn't say the whole truth. Right? Now this happens a number of times in the Torah. You find Abraham, you find Isaac, you find Yaakov, you find them all in different times saying things that aren't true mm-hmm. for the greater good. And here it's for the greater good. God says, Sarah, you need to educate your wife as to how, you know, what it means to be, to follow me. That if I say that your wife can get pregnant, she can get pregnant. If I say you'll have a baby, you'll have a baby. Right? That's the reason God spoke to him. But he, but he didn't tell him the whole story because he didn't want to hurt Abraham's feelings. He didn't want to cause a fight between a husband and a wife. So it says, now it, we learn a very important lesson, which it is, it is um, even God would stretch the truth for a husband and wife to be together. But that's the idea, that a husband and wife should have a fight between them. So that should not happen. God would stretch the truth. And that's where we see it. Mm-hmm. And it's a, a very important lesson because the idea of peace in a household is a very important thing. And it's very hard to achieve. And here God is showing us how important it is. That, that's, 
right? An important message that comes out of that. So, so then watch what happens next. So, so God says to Abraham, right, this whole story, and is there anything behind Hashem at the appointed time? I will return to you at this time next year and say I will have a son. Now God himself says, I will come back next year and, I, and, and your wife will, get, will have a son. Next year on Passover, she'll have a son. So Sarah denies it. Right? Abraham confronts her and says, listen, Sarah, you know, uh, you, uh, you don't laugh at God. God can do anything he wants. So Sarah says, what? I didn't laugh. She's not being straight either. But it says why? Because she was frightened. But he says, no, you laughed. In other words, she was frightened that, that um, she would have a problem now because she said her husband is old. She doesn't realize at this point that God changed it so that she should, there shouldn't be a problem. So she was frightened. I don't want to have a problem with my husband. And, and no, you did laugh, but that's all. That's all God, God told him. So that closes the section. But you see that God's idea was correct. She was afraid that she was going to have a problem with her husband now. And she didn't have it because God did that. So then we see, so now what happens? The men got up from there and they gazed towards Sodom while Abraham walked with them to escort them. So now you have the three men, these three angels, leaving Abraham and on their way to Sodom. Because we know later that Sodom is going to be destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed and um, because they're a terrible place, and they're on their way to do it. And But it says that Abraham escorts them. What's the purpose of that? Here you have a guy who's so sick that God comes to visit him. He's in the third day after his surgery, and he and and he's clearly not feeling well. And these men are leaving. They walk there on their own. They can't walk away on their own. Why, is that him, why does he escort him? So the, from this, the Talmud tells us that um, that a person who's a guest in your home is, while they're a guest in your home, they always have a little bit of insecurity. No matter how nice you are to them, I'm still taking your food, sleeping in your house, taking your items. And even though you you seem to be very nice about it and you want me to, there's always a little insecurity. One way they can tell is if you want to get rid of them as fast as possible, they know they, that they overstayed their welcome, they, that, they're, that you're not happy with them. But if they're leaving, and you can't bear to see them leave, then they know that you really wanted them there. So Abraham does what's become a very long, very age-old Jewish custom, is they leave, that he walks outside with them, yeah. so that he should accompany them. He's not going to Sodom with them. He's not going yeah. far. He just walks them to the end of his property. He walks them a couple of blocks. Like, I don't want you to leave. It's just like, you know, I was noticing it today. I was driving here. And I, just, I, I was, and I get behind a school bus. Right? It's a big enough pain to be behind a school bus, but it's important. You wait right, for them to pick up the kids. It's an important thing. You know, play around with that. But, but it's a bit of a pain. And I'm watching. And, the school, and what do you have? A bunch of kids with their parents standing there. The kids get on. And what do the parents do? They don't just turn away and walk. They stand there and they wave at the kids to the window. Like, well, they're going to see them again in a few hours. Yeah. They were just with them. The kids probably are already thinking about their friends, right? But the parents are standing there waving. Why? Because in the mind of the parents, I want my, my child to feel that I'm going to miss them, that I'm waiting for them to come back, that I'm going to be right here when their bus comes back. So I wave at them. I watch them through the window as they leave. Even if the kid might want them, or not, doesn't care. It makes no difference. The parent feels this. That's what Abraham's doing. The exact same thing. Abraham is escorting them out to let them know you're welcome in my house anytime. I'm sorry that you're leaving. I want one more moment with you before you go. And that's why he does that. So, and then Hashem says, Shall I conceal from Abraham what I do? Now that Abraham is surely to become great and mighty nation. Right? And so forth. Um, in other words, God is about to destroy Sodom. We'll describe what that is a bit. Um, and God says, Abraham is my beloved. And right? he's bringing the world to its purpose. What is it, why, why does God create the world? He wants to better the world. He wants to be the world to be a better place. Well, it's not working. People are pagans. People don't really care about the worth of a human life. People are interested in themselves. So, yeah, so God find, Abraham finally discovers God, and God works with him to become the teacher to the world of being an ethical person, being a good person. And, and now... 
God sees that there are a couple of cities that are beyond repair. Sodom was a city that stood for everything bad. Like, there were all types of rules in Sodom. The Sodom, if you, you, you could only live in, in, in Hebrew, it's called Stom. You could only live in Stom if you gave more to the, to the city than you took, which means you could move there if you were rich. If you're rich, so then you're being here, you'll spend money, you'll help the economy. But if you're not rich, you can't come here because then you'll just take, you know, you'll, you'll take money. You'll be on welfare. We don't have welfare here. You're not allowed, in fact, in Sodom, you weren't allowed to give charity. You gave charity, they would, pr- they would prosecute you. It was against the law to give charity. Because you weren't, if you were receiving charity, you shouldn't be there. Right? You know, if you gave charity, you were just encouraging people not to work. Right? Sounds very, very Republican, no? Mm-hmm. So you're, that's what it's saying. You encourage people not to work. So therefore, don't give them charity. You shouldn't have anyone here doesn't. They, they didn't want to give in any way, which was why there, there they had, um, like they had forced homosexuality. I'm not talking about the homosexuality that they deal with today. We're talking about the act of homosexuality. Right? The, 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 why is it? Because they're able to have an act of intimacy with absolutely no chance of propagating the world. You can't fill the world, right? You, you can't have children. So therefore, they would only have relations in a way where they couldn't have children. And not just men with men, anyone. When they would have relations, it was so you couldn't have children. Why? Because children take. They take from society. It's, right, that, that's what it is, the, what they, what, 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 why they were bad. So they couldn't do that. Right? Um, you know, anything that was an act of giving, anything that, that, that caused you to do something like that, they didn't allow. And that, took, said, God said, is beyond the pale. There's no, there's no fixing this society. But he had a problem. Because in, in living there was Lot, Abraham's nephew, was living in Sodom, which was already a problem because Lot started out to be a very righteous person. By, then he becomes rich, and then he moves to Sodom. Right? And he becomes, not, he, he's not fully that way, but you see that he's, he's been corrupted to some extent, which we'll see when we get to that part of the story. So God's going to destroy the city, and he says, well, shouldn't I tell Abraham I'm going to do this? Right? He says, I, I've, I love him. I love Abraham, because he commands his children and his household after him that they should keep the way of God, doing charity and justice, in order that God might bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. So Hashem says, because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah becomes so great, and because their sin has been very grave, I will descend and see if they act in accordance with, um, with its outcry, which has come to me. Then I'll destroy it. And if not, I'll know. So the men had turned from there and went to Sodom while Abraham was still standing before God. Abraham says, now he starts negotiating. God tells him, I'm going to destroy Sodom. So Abraham says, well, would you stamp out the righteous among the wicked? So God, he says to God, listen, will you actually go somewhere and, and you've got bad people and you've got good people and you'll kill even the good people in order to get the bad people? Would you do that? Would you kill the righteous in order to get to the wicked? He, so Abraham says, what if there were 50 righteous people in Sodom? Isn't that enough people to save the city? He says to God. Would you still stamp it out rather than spare the place for the sake of 50 people within it? It would be sacrilege for you to do this, to bring death upon the righteous along with the wicked. Uh, God, uh, Abraham's giving God a lecture. He's saying, what, what, what will people say about you? You're going to kill all those people, and among them are 50 righteous people? People are going to say, God, that you're not a very... You're going to kill them, no matter who they are? You're going to kill all those people? So God says, well, there, you know, Abraham, uh, uh, God tells Abraham, well, there aren't 50. So Abraham comes back and he says, okay, look, you know, take, maybe there's 45. And then he goes down to 40, he goes down to 30, and he goes down to 10. And God keeps saying, I'm sorry, there isn't 10, there isn't 20, there isn't a... He keeps going lower and lower and lower and lower, right? So he says, what if 10 would be found there? And he says, I won't destroy if there's 10. So then Hashem leaves when he finishes speaking to Abraham, and, and Abraham goes home. He, he loses. Right? There aren't ten righteous people in all of Sodom. So Abraham says, I, you know, I, okay. So it says two angels come to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gate. Why he sits at the gate is because traditionally in ancient societies, the judge sat at the gate to the city. So if you had a dispute, you would go to the gate of the city. And Lot was the most righteous of the people, so he was the judge. Now Lot saw and stood up to meet them, 
right? And he bowed down, and he says, Oh, my lords, turn about. Please come to my house, spend the night and wash your feet, and wake up early and go your way. You notice how similar to Abraham he is, right? Lot is his nephew. Wash your feet, come to my house. Even in, remember, in Sodom, you're not allowed to invite people over. You're not allowed to have guests. So he sneaks them in, and he says, they said, no, rather we'll spend the night in the square. And he says, no, no, no. They, and they say, okay, come to my house. and uh, We'll come to your house. And they, he made a feast for them, and he baked matzah. Right here it says literally matzah, and they ate. They had not yet laid down when the townspeople, the Sodomites, converged upon the house from young to old and all the people. And they called to Lot and they said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them. Right? In other words, they found out Lot's breaking the law. He's got these people in this house. He's got guests. Send them out here that we should know them. You know what that means. That's a, you know how they have the biblical knowledge? That's what it's saying. We're going to rape them. Come on out. All the men of the city come. Listen, we're going to rape these guys. Right? Why? Because this is Sodom. Right? We're going to have pleasure with them, and they shouldn't be here. So he says, I beg you, my brothers, don't act this way. See now, I have two daughters who have never known a man. I'll bring them to you, and you should do it to, the, do it to them. Now, don't think that the Torah is telling you that it's okay to do this to women. They're showing you how corrupt Lot has become. Even though Lot is the most righteous person there, he's become corrupted to the point, sort of like, you know, they have an expression that if you grow up in a house of murderers and you're only a thief, then you're righteous. Right? It's an expression people say. You're not really righteous, you're still a thief. Right? And if you're living in a city where people are going, to, where men are going to rape men, right? So Lot thinks, well, at least it's not as bad if they rape a woman, not because she's a woman, because it's it's because that's normal relations, right? He, he's corrupted. His mind is corrupted already. But he's nobody rationalizes that he says is okay, right? Remember, this is Sodom, but he thinks he can entice them to do that. It's a horrible thing, a man to get, to offer his children like that. And, and to think that it's better to attack women than men, right? The whole thing is crazy. But, right, because Lot is living in Sodom. He's affected by it. And they said, stand back. This fellow came to sojourn and would act as a judge, right? This Lot's going to tell us what to do. Now we'll treat you worse than them. And they pushed against the house so they could break it in and get the guy, the men. The men stretched out their hand and brought Lot into the house. So now these angels, who look like men, bring Lot into the house, away from the bad guys. And the men who were at the entrance of the house, they, they were struck with blindness from mm. small to great, and they tried vainly to find the entrance. So now, of course, the angels, meaning the will of God, stops the men from getting into the house. It makes them blind. Then the men said to Lot, Whom else do you have here? A son-in-law, your sons or your daughters? All that you have in the city are removed from the place, for we are about to destroy this place, for their outcries become great. So now the angels say, look, Lot, you think you can live here and, and you're going to be okay? Look what's happened to you. Take your stuff and get out of here. We're destroying the city. So this is where you have the famous story of Lot and his wife and his daughters leaving the city, right? And, you know, don't look back, that whole story. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws and, the, and his engaged daughters, and he said, get up and leave, for Hashem is about to destroy the city. But he seemed like a jester in the eyes of his son-in-laws. Remember, Lot before said, I have sons, who, my daughters, who never knew a man, right? So you see how corrupted he was. They actually did. He was not only, was he prepared to give up his daughters, they weren't, they were married women, right? right? And then his son-in-laws are so corrupt, they're regular sodomites, they say, hey, tell, what? Oh yeah, God's going to destroy our city. What, you're crazy? And they make fun of him, right? So they, so they leave, they're not going to go. And just as dawn was breaking, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your daughters, right? unless we're, uh, you want to be killed. So Lot still waited. So the men grasped him by his hand, his wife's hand, and the hand of his two daughters, in Hashem's mercy, and took him out and looked outside the city. So Lot himself was, so again, so corrupted that he didn't even believe it was going to happen. Right? So the angels had to grab him and his wife and his daughters and throw him out of the city in order to get him out of there before they destroy it. And it was as they took him out that one said, flee for your life, don't look behind you, or stop anywhere, flee to the mountains. Lot says, please, no. See, your servant has found grace in your eyes, and your kindness was great. You have saved my life, but I can't escape to the mountains. But please, the city is near enough to escape there, and it's small. I shall flee there. Is it not small? I'll live. They said, look, we've given you, we've done enough for you. I, 
I will not overturn the city about which you have spoken. And hurry, go there. So they say, go, you can go to that city. The sun rose upon the earth, and Lot arrived in Zoar. Now Hashem had caused sulfur and rain to fall upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Hashem out of heaven. He overturned these cities and the entire plain with all the inhabitants. And his, uh, and as his wife peered behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Right? In other words, she, she was already corrupted as well. She was looking behind them in a literal sense. And one thing, in a figurative sense, it means that she was longing to get back to that life. Mm-hmm. She wanted to live there. It was decadent. and had whatever you wanted. And as long as you had money, you could do anything you wanted. And they had money, so they did whatever they wanted. She wanted to get back to it. So God said, that's it. She's gone. That's why you see from now on, there's just Lot and his daughters. Right? So he goes here with his two daughters. Right? They go live in a cave. And here's where you find an amazing story. The older daughter says to the younger, our father is old. Right? And there's no man in the land to marry us. They think the whole world's been destroyed. Right? They think that's it. We're Adam and Eve. That's it. There's no more people. It's us two girls and our father. That's it. Two women and their father. Our father's old. There's no man to marry us. Come, let us ply our father with wine and lay with him, and he can give life to offspring. So we're going to get our father drunk. We're going to get him to have relations with us. We'll get pregnant, and we're going to carry on humankind. Right? So again, they think they're doing a good act, but they're so corrupted that they don't understand right from wrong. They're actually going to commit incest because they think they're saving the world. Right? right? We have, and these are people who do terrible things because they're so, they're, their minds are so corrupted that they think they're good. Right? The world is filled with this kind of stuff. Right? The people who, who, who think Hitler, right? he thought he, he was doing the world a favor by killing the Jews. Right? Anyone who wants to have ethnic cleansing thinks he's doing the world a favor by killing off somebody. Any person who goes out to kill another religion, they're, they're a person from another religion, because that person is practicing the wrong religion, right, is doing just like this. And they're doing a, a horrible thing because they think it's good. And it's not good. There is, an, there is an ultimate truth, and it's wrong. And what they're doing is also wrong. So it says, on the next day, uh, right, they got up and they did it, right? And the father had no idea what he was doing. It says, on the next day, the older one said to the younger, Behold, I lay with my father last night. Let us ply him with wine again, and now it's your turn. So they did it again, right? And they had relations with the other one. Thus, Lot's two daughters conceived from their father. And here's an interesting point. The older one bore a son, and she called his name Moab. He's the ancestor of the people of Moab. There's a nation called Moab. Ruth, for instance, comes from there. Until this day. And the younger one also bore a son, and she named his name Ben-Ami. He is the ancestor of Ammon, which is like Ben-Ami, until this day. But here's a very interesting thing. Um, Moab and and Ammon are both very similar names, because Moab means Moab, from my father. This child is from my father. It's, this is a result of incest, this child. Amun is, comes from Ben-Ami. This child is the son of my people. She doesn't say it. The first se- sister, the older sister, who's the instigator of the whole thing, says she's very open about what she's saying. She's saying, you don't like it? I had incest with my father. This is my offspring. Too bad for you. She's right in your face. You think something wrong with incest? Well, I don't. And, I, and she names her son incest. That's basically what she calls him. The other daughter says, you know, I'm a little embarrassed about what I did. She says, this child comes from my people. Right? She, it is her father, but she doesn't want to say it straight out. Later on in history, we have, um, you know, that we, we have these rules about Moab and Ammon. And it says that they're related to us because Lot was Abraham's nephew. So his incestuous children are also our relations, even though we might not like to have them around, but they are. So it says that, you know, we're not supposed to go to war with them. It says in history, like later on, when the Jews are leaving Egypt, they go through the land of Moab and the land of Ammon, and, and the people in those lands don't want to let the Jews through. So we say, like, these are our relatives. We can't fight them. But the Torah says that there's a difference. With Moab, it says you can do guerrilla warfare. You can do terrorism against them. If you want to try to show them, you know, we're coming through, you're allowed to do it. You can go in and do some terrorism, but Ammon, you can't. What's the difference? It says Moab right, was chutzpah. 
That's right. The incest. Uh, my name is incest, right? And that's how they acted. They were. We don't care what you say. Whatever, anything I do is right. I don't want to let you go through our land. I'm going to stop you from going through our land. And I don't care what you say. They're right in your face. So those people, you can give them a hard time. Ammon, on the other hand, they were they were more civilized. They were not in your face. They were more subtle in, in it. And therefore, you're not allowed to attack them at all. And you see, God actually recognizes the difference in the two. Right? Then the story changes at the bottom. It says, Abraham journeyed from there to the region of the south and settled in these different places. Right? And, and um, we have the whole story of his traveling. I just want to get to a part, since we're down to the last few minutes, that might be a little more significant for our discussions. Um, so we have, um, if you look on 95, Hashem had remembered Sarah. He says he'd come back in a year. She'll give birth. He remembers, as of course. And he said, Hashem did for Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore a son unto Abraham in his old age at the appointed time which God had said. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah had born to him, Isaac. Yitzchak. In Hebrew, the word laughter is schok. Yitzchak. Same word, right? Schok, schok. So you're saying, whoever here is going to laugh. I'm an old lady. I had a baby. Everyone who sees this hundred-year-old lady walking around with a little baby, they're going to laugh at me, right? right? And she said, who is the one... Uh, God had made laughter for me. Whoever hears will laugh for me. And she said, who is the one who said to Abraham, Sarah would nurse children? Right? God, right? God says to her, um, who says that Sarah will nurse children? For I have born a son in his old age. The children grew and were weaned. Now we have this whole story that, that goes on here that Sarah realizes that, that Yitzchak is in danger because Yishmael, the older brother from a different mother, is 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 um, treating him badly. Some interpret is that he actually tries to kill him. So Sarah, it says, goes to Abraham in this page, and she says, you, you, I want you, at the top of page 97, drive out the slave woman with her son, for the son of that slave woman shall not inherit with my son, with Isaac. She says, even though that that boy, Yishmoel, comes from you, from you, he's going to kill Isaac. He's, he's a dangerous person. Get rid of them, him and his mother. So Abraham is very upset about this, as it says, because Abraham's known for kindness. He's going to send his own son away. right? So God says to Abraham, do not be distressed over the youth of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you, heed her voice. This is an extremely important statement. Whatever Sarah says, you listen to her. God is saying that Sarah was a greater prophet than Abraham. But this happens repeatedly with our forefathers, that the women are more superior spiritually than the men. And here, God is telling Abraham, don't just listen to Sarah here. Whatever Sarah says, listen to her. Period. Sarah knows better. Right? It's an extremely important statement because whenever somebody says that the history of monotheistic religions are paternalistic and that women are abused, it is true that men abuse women. But it is not true that Judaism in any way allows the abuse of women. It happened. Men can be brutes, but Judaism does not allow it, right? In many societies, women were, were left to be illiterate. In Judaism, they were always educated. And when you have a history where people I, I discounted women, here you see a perfect example where the Torah tells us that God said that Abraham is to listen to whatever his wife says, period. Not just now, not with this, always. Whatever your wife says, she knows. Right? It's a very important statement. Right? And because of it, he sends them away. Now, the Ramban, very interesting, the Ramban, who right, was one of our most uh, accomplished commentators, says that you want to know why the Arabs hate us today? You know, today. Like, you ever wonder why they hate us? What is it that they hate us? They hated us before the state of Israel. So it's not the state of Israel, right? What is it? We're so similar to them. Our religion has so many similar beliefs to theirs. Our customs are so similar. Our language, Arabic and Hebrew, is so similar that if I listen to someone speak Arabic slowly, I can understand a lot of what they say, and I don't know Arabic because it's so similar to Hebrew. There's so many similarities between us. So why do they hate us? We're not the crusaders. That's why they hate the Christians. They, 
that we weren't the Crusaders. We didn't massacre them. That, I, 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 like we don't have a history of that. What is it? This is what it was. The Ramban says that Sarah, on her level, because she was such a great person, sinned, allowed her personal feelings to enter in the situation. Because you can imagine that if you, um, uh, you're a, a woman and you have a, um, a maid and you can't have children and you give, tell your husband to have relations with the maid, right? and I'll raise the child, right? I'll raise the child with my maid, and then you have a child... And the maid's child is trying to hurt your child. Now, imagine the emotions that are going on whenever this maid comes into the room. This, she, the maid rebelled against her. The maid felt, I'm, a, I'm not your maid anymore. I'm a equal to you. I'm the princess just like you. And, and she, it must be a very difficult situation. And we, we, don't, we, we don't think that she acted like we would act. But at her level of spirituality, a little bit of that entered, according to the Ramban. And because of that, the Ramban says Sarah sinned and sent them out. And because of that, till this day, the offspring of Ishmael hate us. Now, whenever the expression is found anywhere in any of our literature that says, until this day, it means forever. It means whatever day you're reading this, it's still mm -hmm. happening. You find this expression in many places in the Torah. And he uses that expression because he's telling us that's why. The bottom line is, this is, this is where it comes from. Because there was a uh, apparent cruelty to their 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 family, to Yishmoel. Um Rather than going through all the rest, because we only have a minute, I'll tell you an interesting medrash that I used. I spoke about once on Rosh Hashanah. I told you Abraham's such a kind person. You see, if you read the Torah in more in depth than we did, you'll see how he how kind he was. He's known for it. Now he has to send away his son. You know he doesn't want to send away his son. His son is a child. He's a young man, right? He's being sent away. Not even a young man. He's like an adolescent. He's being sent away. Do you think, don't you think that Abraham ever went to see him? He just forgot him? That was it? The only, next time you see Ishmael is at Abraham's funeral. It's the only, next time he's mentioned in the Torah is at Abraham's funeral. Do you, ever, you, know, do you think that Abraham ever went to see him? Cared? Whatever happened to my son? He was my son. Later on, in this same parsha, when it talks about God telling Abraham, I want you to, you know, to offer your son as a sacrifice. So God says, which son? So he, God says, the one you love. And he says, I love both of my sons. And he says, Isaac. Right? So if Abraham was so much in love with his son Yishmael, and he had to send him away, he had no choice. God told him, listen to your wife. He sends him away, and um, do you think if he loved him, he never went to see him? Never? So the Medrash says he did. And the Medrash describes a very interesting story. It says that, that he got on the camel, he asked Sarah's permission to go visit his son, and she gave him permission. And he went to go see his son. And he went, it says in the Medrash, to Mecca, a city called Mecca. And there he found Ishmael's house. And he went to Yishmael's door, and he knocked on the door. And a woman who, whose name was Fatima came to the door. And he said to her, is Yishmael here? And he said, no, he's out with his mother gathering fruits and vegetables. You bring him into the house for us to eat. So Abraham says, I've been on a long trip. May I come in and have a drink? And she says, I'm sorry, we, have, we don't have enough food and drink for you. So he says, tell my son Yishmael, or tell Yishmael, that an old man was here and that your home does not represent you. And he left. And Yishmael comes home and his wife says to him, you know, there was an old man was here. <coughs> and he said, your home does not represent you. And she tells him the whole story and she didn't give him anything to eat or drink. And it says that he divorces his wife because she didn't act properly. It's not the way you live. You Somebody comes to your house, you give them what to eat or drink. And if you only have enough for one person, you give it to the guest. And we know that the Arabs are like that today. Right? And, and, and that came from Abraham. That's how we, we just read the story. How Abraham does it. He does it too. So it says Abraham decides he's going to come again. He didn't get to see his son. So the next year comes, he gets on his camel, he rides out to Mecca, gets to the door of his house, knocks on the door, and, his, and a new woman is there. Her name is Ayesha. And Yesha answers the door, 
And he says, Where, is Yishmoel here? She says, no, I'm sorry, he's out with his mother gathering fruits and vegetables. Will he be back soon? We, I don't know when. But would you like something to eat or drink? And may I give something to your camel? And she invites him in. And he sits down and he speaks to her. And they have a conversation. And she eats and he drinks. And, he's, and he blesses her. And, and he leaves. Ishmael comes home and he sees his house. It's like, like the sun inside his house. It's bright, like a light inside his house. Now, there's no lights back then. Bright, filled with fruits and vegetables and all kinds of things. The whole house is what happened. Because remember, the man didn't give a message. He didn't say, tell Ishmael anything. She says, a man was here. He asked for you. I offered him something to eat and drink. I offered to take care of his camel. And he said he didn't want to wait and he left. And, and, and that's the end of the Midrash. So it tells us a number of very important things. It tells us how important family is, that even though Yishmael was so different and was rejected, he still loved him. He still cared about him. He still wanted his best. Right? You see how he does it. Second thing was how Yishmael learned from his father, how important it was. The third is a historic lesson. It's a very interesting historic lesson. If you know Islam at all, you'll know certain facts, which I might be off a little, but in general... The, these are accurate. We, I said he was in Mecca. Right? Mecca, of course, is very central as a holy city for Islam. His wife's first wife's name was Fatima. Fatima was the name of Mohammed's beloved daughter. And his second, the se second wife of Ishmael's name was Ayesha. Ayesha was the name of Mohammed's wife. So we don't know for sure if the details of this medrash were what was written in the first century. They may have added to it because there were times in history when the rabbis were attempting to bring the Muslims and the Jews closer, not religiously, but on a sociological level, that we should get along with each other. We're so similar. Right? So that might be why they use those names, because they're inconsequential. They, it doesn't matter what their names were. The story is what's important. The story teaches us, the most, I think, the very significant lesson, that even if your child is not like you, even if your child goes in a different way, you still love them, and you still care for them. Right? And Abraham did that. He showed that. He showed that love for his child, no matter what happened to him. And Sarah, who didn't have that feeling, it wasn't her child, are around on Shabbos, and you want to hear the, uh, the class this week, I'm doing the evil eye. I want to talk about does it exist? Is it real? Hmm? What time is that at? It's uh, right after the end of our service, about 11.20, 11.30 in the morning. And then we have Kiddush afterwards. We have numerous classes here in the morning after services, so that's my class. So last week I did angels and demons. This week I'll talk about the evil eye. Does it really exist? Because, you know, you find the evil eye in almost every culture. Yeah. Oh, and the same expression. Yeah. So is there a reason for that? Yeah. Well, I just put an, advertise, an advertisement, see?